a little bit our lecture session for the day and let me just start off with saying good morning and welcome to the second session of uh, module number two um, otherwise known as the advanced management of HIV and AIDS and we are proceeding with our lecturer introduction so let me just share my screen Ayan. I-play na natin agad. Ayan. Pinag-effortan ko yung animation nito. Anyway, so our lecturer for the day has extensive experience in academic, HIV care medicine, and also in clinical and molecular research studies and currently the Director of National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology in National Institute of Health in the University of the Philippines, Manila. He is also an institutional representative of the Global Fund Country Coordinating Mechanism, the Chair of External Linkages for Research Office in University of the Philippines, Manila, and also uh, the Chair of the HIV Subcommittee of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, an attending physician, um, a scientist, a researcher, and also a professor in UP Manila. Ayan. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce Dr. Edsel More uh, Maurice Salvania for the Lecture 11 on Treatment, Failure, and Possible Resistance. Ayan. Dr. Edsel, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, let me... Let me just grab the chart here. Can, you, can everyone hear me? Yes, Paul. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so we're here to talk about HIV with possible treatment failure, which is becoming more and more uh, prevalent among our patients. We did a study about three, four years ago, and uh, we found that about 10% uh, of patients fail uh, treatment in the first year. And uh, that's actually following, uh, with people who followed for a whole year. So if we put in the uh, dropout rate, which is about 20%, um, you know, it really comes out to a much higher failure rate than that. So our objectives are really we want to talk about this in a case-based fashion because it's really easier to learn um, uh, with, with cases that uh, we encounter in the clinic. So when do we suspect treatment failure? Uh, what is an HIV resistance assay? How do we start second line ARV options? And how do we promote adherence in our patients so that uh, they don't fail treatment? Uh, so the problem really with HIV is that it's one of the fastest mutating uh, organisms on the planet. In fact, it mutates 100,000 times faster than bacteria. And fa part of the reason for this is because it's, uh, it's an RNA virus and it uses reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase is a lousy enzyme in terms of proofreading, so it makes a lot of mistakes and it keeps mutating itself. Um, uh, putting that into perspective, you know, you have a patient who has about uh, 10 to the 10th virions per day uh, being replicated. And if you're, if, you're, if you're mutating, you know, you can actually mutate the whole genome several times a day. It's a, it's a real problem. On top of that, the viral genome is actually you have two strands of RNA and it can recombine when you have two different subtypes that are uh, infecting um, a cell. And so they can recombine, they can have uh, HIV babies. Uh, if we think about the role of antiretrovirals uh, in our patients, if we look at the cell cycle, um, we've, we've done really, really well in terms of looking for targets for, for stopping HIV in its tracks. And um, so, for instance, uh, I don't know if you can see the arrow. Um, you have your CCR5 receptor here, which we can block uh, uh, with, with um, like Maravaroc, and those CCR5 antagonists are also monoclonal antibodies. That can do that. And then, of course, a major target is reverse transcriptase, uh, which the virus uses to go from RNA to DNA, um, uh, which then integrates into the cell. So we have nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors uh, in the Philippines. This is idovudine, tenofovir, lamivudine. Uh, we used to have stavudine, thank God we don't use that drug anymore. Um, and I think abacavir is, uh, is available in limited supply. And then um, we also have uh, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which still act through the reverse transcriptase. And then we have integrase inhibitors, hopefully will come uh, dolutegravir soon. Um, and this prevents the 
uh, HIV genome, which is already reverse transcribed from uh, integrating into our host cells. And then from there, the integrated viral DNA is transcribed into uh, is, is transcribed into mRNA and then translated into protein, into one long protein, which is then chopped up by protease, which is also a target for our medications. And then there are also maturation inhibitors, which prevent HIV from being properly assembled and maturing. So we have lots of areas. So how does, how does uh, resistance develop? And part of the problem is that in somebody who has a lot of virus, um, there will already be mutated drug-resistant viruses. Because remember that the virus is constantly mutating. Some of those mutants are actually defective mutants. In fact, 99.9% .9 of the virus in, in someone who is not on ARV's blood is actually not replication competent, meaning that it doesn't really, um, it, doesn't, it can't really infect. So that's how bad the mutation is. But some of those viruses uh, are replication competent and also have uh, genes for drug resistance. And so, um, but every time the virus mutates, uh, you end up with, uh, you know, every time it mutates, it comes at a cost to, to the virus, either uh, in terms of replicative capacity or how well it can uh, replicate itself, or also in terms of viral fitness. So it's not a very fit virus. So it's not good for the virus to be mutated. And so in somebody who is not on antiretrovirals, you'll have the minority of drug-resistant viruses, and then you have a majority of drug-susceptible viruses because there is no drug pressure. So if you have good ARV pressure, then it's unlikely that those drug-resistant viruses will be able to replicate. But if you're not taking your medications properly and there is some partial drug pressure, then you will select against these blue areas, these blue viruses, to the point that even if you then continue taking your ARVs, you have more and more drug-resistant virus, uh, which then leads to treatment failure. So when we talk about HIV drug resistance, so these are the definitions that are used by WHO. When we say acquired HIV drug resistance, this is HIV resistance that develops when you're on treatment. So somebody who's taking medications who has completely susceptible virus at the start, doesn't take their medications um, religiously, and you end up with drug-resistant virus. So that's what we call acquired HIV drug resistance, or ADR. And then the second is called transmitted HIV drug resistance in someone who has never received any ARVs. You know, some people can get um, suboptimal ARVs, lalo na somebody who has uh, hepatitis B, and they get tenofovir, but they don't get lamivudine and efavirenz kasi tinitreat lang nila yung hep B, hindi naman nila alam na may HIV yung pasyente. So you expose them to tenofovir, and that's suboptimal medication for HIV. So... Um, ang, ang tawag doon is uh, yung number three, yung pretreatment HIV drug resistance. If somebody has never been exposed to ARVs ever, then that's what we call transmitted drug resistance because that is a viral resistance that is transmitted from the person who infected them who probably was on treatment and had acquired drug resistance. So, linipat niya yung kanyang transmitted virus to someone who is completely antiretroviral naive. So, yun ang pinatawag na TDR. So, those are your answers for your, for your pretests. Medyo mahirap yung pretest, no? I mean, I was looking at it like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> this is how we learn. So, and then pretreatment HIV drug resistance. This is people who had prior exposure to ARVs. Uh, again, either the tenofovir for the hepatitis B, or back in the day kasi in Africa, they used to give single-dose nevirapine to pregnant women at the time of birth to prevent maternal-to-child transmission. Unfortunately, that uh, led to a lot of pretreatment HIV drug resistance. So just to recap, ADR, or acquired HIV drug resistance, is the resistance that develops on treatment. Transmitted drug resistance is resistance that is transmitted from somebody who probably has acquired drug resistance to somebody who has never, ever seen antiretrovirals. And number three is uh, pretreatment HIV drug resistance, which is people who uh, had, who saw uh, a previous treatment um, with like tenofovir or single-dose nevirapine, or it's actually a bigger subset. It can also include transmitted drug resistance. So, mas uh, specific yung TDR na kailangan never exposed to drug um, whereas yung pretreatment, pwedeng never exposed to drug, 
or meron ring prior uh, ARV exposure, pero they stopped it. So, this is the first case. 28-year-old uh, male diagnosed with HIV in 2012. CD4 count is 174. And then back then, we used to start Zidovudine, Nevirapine, and Lamivudine without any problems. And then the patient was lost to follow up after one year of treatment. And now he comes back to your clinic and he's been off meds for three months. He now wants to go back to ARVs and swears he will never stop them again. Sound familiar? I think we've all had this patient before. So what approach is the most reasonable in terms of managing this patient's ARVs? So do we check the CD4 count before resuming ARVs? Do we check the viral load before resuming ARVs? Do we send drug resistance assay before resuming ARVs? Do we start the old regimen? Or do we start a new regimen in off of here plus lamivudine plus a traverence? Okay. So um, I think, you know, just, uh, oh, okay. There's a question here. All right, great. So, yeah, so go ahead and uh, answer and then submit and then we'll see what happens. Is it going to come up? Yes. yes, sir. So I'm going to give them five seconds to answer. Mm -hmm. Five, four, answer po tayo. So about 35% have answered. Please click everybody. Once we reach a substantial amount, we will launch it. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. With 70% who answered, ito po yung sagot. Okay. <laughs> All right, the answer is uh, letter D, um, and we'll talk about that, okay? Um, let me see if I can get myself back, okay? So, oops, all right. So, here are the explanations. So, the answer is D, okay? Start the old regimen. Why is that? And again, it goes back to selection pressure for the patient. So, if we check a CD4 account, um, yeah, you could do that if you want to, but you know you expect it to be lower because it's uh, the patient's not been uh, on the medications, but it's not a requirement for restarting ARVs at this time. Okay, so check viral load. It's almost certainly going to be positive because the patient's not been not been taking their meds. So matas yung viral load mo. Um, the only that would be an academic exercise if you wanted to see it go down from a baseline. But again, it's not necessary. Okay, so send drug resistance assay before resuming ARVs. And this is the tricky part because if you are off medications, there is no drug pressure. And as we said before, nagre revert siya to wild type. So, yung test kasi na ginagawa, yung genotyping, it can only detect resistance if 20% or more of the virus population has the mutation. Otherwise, it will miss it. So it may detect it, but then again, it may miss it. So it's not the best uh, time to do it. What you really want to do is restart the old regimen and then check another viral load in anywhere from... Um, uh, usually, we go, we say about um, uh, anywhere from uh, 12 to 16 uh, weeks. Um, it, can, it can go to about three months if you want. You can check it earlier if you really want to, especially with some of our more potent regimens. But if at three months and you really check it, the viral load is about 1,000, then that's a the time you can do drug resistance testing with the old regimen on board so that you're fairly confident that the uh, medication, uh, that, that the virus really is, uh, is, is undergoing drug pressure. Kung undetectable siya, then you can continue taking it. Uh, you can continue taking your old regimen. That means that uh, wala talagang resistance. Okay? Start the old regimen. Again, this is the correct answer because if you start the old regimen, you're not compromising anything that hasn't been compromised before and it will help you determine if drug resistance is present by doing the viral load again in about three months. And uh, you don't want to start a new regimen because, for instance, resistant na siya to EFAB, resistant na siya to lamivudine, so, you monotherapy ka with the tenofovir, and then you will use you will lose tenofovir talaga, kasi you don't have three active drugs, and you end up with some optimal therapy. So, the bottom line is you want to start with the old regimen so that you can check if it's still good or not. Repeat the viral load at three months. If the viral load is greater than a thousand, we do drug resistance testing. If it's suppressed, then you just continue your medications, and uh, there is no resistance. 
Okay, so when we talk about uh, drug resistance assays, there's two types, there's genotypic and phenotypic. We don't have phenotypic in the Philippines. Um, this uh, involves fusing the virus with the simian virus and uh, doing a lot of uh, lab assays. And we don't do that here. What we really have is genotypic resistance where we sequence the virus. Um, it's available in two places, RITM and also here in NIH. Um, and, uh, we use the mutations to predict drug resistance, especially for NRTIs and NNRTIs. To a certain extent, it's okay with protease inhibitors, but um, sometimes they don't necessarily match. So when we do genotype testing, we actually just, we just amplify part of the virus, the reverse transcriptase gene and also the protease gene. So we, uh, we do that, we do a PCR, we do sequencing, and then again, it will detect uh, the mutation if it's in about 10 to 20% of the virus population. This is more likely if you are on treatment. If you're not on treatment, then it's plus minus. Sometimes you'll find it, sometimes you won't find it. There are other methods where we've been doing deep sequencing, but it's not ready for prime time yet. And deep sequencing is about 50,000 pesos per sample. So we're probably not going to do that yet, but we're working on it uh, to get the cost down. So this is just what the resistance patterns look like. Um, it, it, it looks intimidating, but all this really is, um, so this is a gene. So for instance, we look at penofovir. One of the most common re, uh, mutations is K65R. So that just means it's a 65th uh, position on the, um, on the reverse transcriptase gene. And there is a codon mutation that turns K into R. Those are the amino acids. Um, don't ask me to... Uh, remember what these, uh, these stand for, but they are amino acid uh, mutations, basically, and that causes high level resistance to tenofovir. One of the most common is something called M184V, and that's a lamivudine resistance mutation. Again, it's in the 184th position. It turns the methionine into either valine or isoleucin, um, and that causes resistance to lamivudine and uh, m tricyclamine as well. So that's how we report the mutations. For NNRTIs, the Favarins, the Travirin, the Virapine, we also do the Ravirin and the um, and real pivirine, you can see that there are certain mutations here that are across the board. So for instance, for efavirenz, if you have a K103N in efavirenz, it also makes you resistant to nevirapine, K103N, but not to etravirine. We see a lot of Y181C um, rather than K103 and in the Philippines, and you can see it really takes out uh, etravirin and it also takes out real pivirine. Okay, so again, going back to the concept of wild type, we want to make sure that there is, there is drug pressure on the virus before we do the drug resistance test. Otherwise, it may miss those uh, resistance and it'll just come out when you restart your medications. Um, and we talked about restarting the old regimen. Okay, so how do we know someone is uh, failing treatment? Okay, so the earliest uh, indication that someone is failing treatment is a non-suppressed viral load. So what we want is a one log decrease. So if from one million copies, dapat maging 100,000 copies na lang siya after one month of ARVs. And we expect that at about uh, three months, dapat less than 1,000 copies na or suppressed na yung patient. If we don't reach those goals, that means there might be resistance going around. Uh, the problem is we don't do baseline viral loads, so how can you say it's a one log decrease? Um, we're starting to do that in PGH where we're doing baseline viral loads and doing a viral load at three months just to see if we can catch the resistance and how much resistance we're going to catch with that. Um, so we'll look for that, for the result of that research uh, in the next year. Um, decreasing CD4 count is a late uh, um, presentation of treatment failure because you're already starting to have a lot of viral replication and immunologic failure. And the last indication of treatment failure is your patient is progressing clinically from in terms of the WHO stage, or you're getting opportunistic infections or just getting uh, wasting uh, disease and getting worse and worse. So the patient's old regimen of Zydo and Lamy and the Virapine is resumed. After three months, viral load is 50,000 copies per ml. Drug resistance genotype is sent and it shows M184B, which shows resistance to lamivudine. Also shows K103N, which is resistance to nevirapine and efavirenz, and there's no drug resistance mutations among the protease inhibitors. Okay, so what's the best regimen for this patient? No change until we get another viral load after three months. 
or do we shift to tenofovir plus zidovudine plus lupinavir with onavir? Take note, if you don't have freestanding zydo, you end up using zydolamiteno, which is okay because uh, it mutates it um, into a more hyper-susceptible uh, version of zydo and teno. We shift to tenofovir plus zydo plus efavirids, um, yeah, because the efavirids resistance is spurious because the patient's never seen uh, efavirids. Okay, you want to answer? <laughs> Please answer the poll, and the poll will end in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. With the 70% of answers, here are the results. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. So the answer actually is B. Okay. There's no point in getting another viral load in three months because your patient already failed treatment. Um, so it's really tenazido no pipito. And you don't want to give efavirenz because there's already K103N. And so when you have K103N, this is why we say NNRTIs have a low barrier to uh, resistance. Because it's resistance, lang, you knock out almost all of the NNRTIs which uh, traditionally has included efavirenz in the therapy. So don't use efavirenz for my K103N, Y181C, Y188. Uh, those, those mutations are pan-NNRTI mutations. It's kind of like um, uh, in antibiotics, more resistant to penicillin. It's So um, the answer is tenozidolopirito. And there's a few caveats here. Again, if you don't have freestanding Zydo, it's okay to keep the lamivudin on because it keeps the 184V, which uh, gives you um, hyper susceptibility to Zydo and to tenofovir. The lopinavir and tonavir, there's two ways to take lopirito. It's four tablets once a day or two tablets twice a day. In patients who are treatment experienced, you should usually use two tablets twice a day. Sa treatment naive lang yung pwede na four tablets uh, once a day. Oops, why is there a... <laughs> I don't know, so the, the, something came up on my screen. Anyway, um, uh, again, so there's no change, there's no point in waiting. If there is something called a blip, and a blip is uh, where you have an increase in the viral load. Uh, you know, it's usually just below a thousand copies. And then you can recheck, and then sometimes it just goes back down. But if it's 50,000, who may talaga Okay, now this is the correct answer. Again, we want three active drugs as standard of care for second line ARVs. There's more and more data that some two drug regimens may actually work very well, and that includes uh, dolutegravir with the mivudine um, and also uh, NRPI sparing regimens like uh, doravirine with um, uh, dolutegravir, I think. The, the bottom line is we're not there yet here in the Philippines because uh, our our drugs right now, our standard is that we have to have three active drugs, uh, two NRTIs, and one other agent. And in this case, it really should be lopinavir ritonavir because we've already compromised our NRTIs. Again, retaining lamivudine is okay. It's not harmful. And then tenola, zydo, efavirenz, you don't want to do that because K103N confers high-level resistance to NNRTIs. So efavirenz will not work. And the reason why we don't like NNRTIs is because, um, you know, it has a low barrier to resistance. Okay, so take-home points. Resistance testing should be done with the original regimen on board to ensure that the resistance mutations can be detected. Um, uh, always make sure that there are three active drugs, two NNRTIs, because either an active NNRTI or a PI. Now, I know that we've had patients who uh, only have one NRTI left. Um, and that's a real problem because eventually the PI will fail. Um, hopefully, we can work with RITM and DOH and trying to get a, a third drug that's active. Usually, um, a, um, in an integrase inhibitor would be great uh, if we can ha uh, work with them to get those drugs so that we have three active drugs. Okay, so case two, 35-year-old male diagnosed with HIV in 2013 with CD4 count of 287 cells. Co-infected with hepatitis B, started on tenofovir plus lamivudine plus efavirenz six months ago. Uh, repeat CD4 count is 198, and subsequent viral load shows 20,000 copies. 
So on further questioning, he recalls that he was given a Decavir by a doctor in 2008 for one year, but he stopped due to the cost. At this point, the correct course of action is do we stop the treatment and send the genotype, continue treatment and send the genotype, or add a Decavir to his regimen and send another viral load in three months? Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, habol papo, and one. With 75% answering, these are the results. Okay, great. <laughs> I think, I, I, I think uh, we made a good impression with, uh, with the last question, Kate. <laughs> so that's good. All right, so absolutely, uh, continue the treatment and send the genome. Let's see. All right, there you go. So if you stop treatment and send the genotype, then you're actually going to end up um, with more resistance because it takes a while to get the treatment back. And uh, what you want to do is, the other problem is efavirenz lasts a lot longer than teno and lani, so you're going to end up with virtual efavirenz monotherapy. So whatever you do, don't stop the medications if you're already on them because the continued drug pressure uh, still makes the virus less fit. Okay? And besides, the exposed ka na dun sa suboptimal regimen. So, you know, you might as well make sure that it's working or not working. Um, uh, and you don't want to add stuff blindly either because you compromise even more. So continue treatment, send the genotype. So just keep it on and then send the genotype. Hopefully we'll get it back to you in two weeks uh, with a recommendation. And then we can adjust the ARDs depending on the resistance pattern. So there's no point in adding in Tecavir because you already have the best drug uh, on it, uh, which is Tenofovir. Um, so Tenolami is the best uh, regimen that you can give for hepatitis B. Um, in fact, the Intecavir is probably the culprit. This is one case of pretreatment drug resistance, most likely, because Intecavir can cause M184V mutation in HIV um, and causing lamivity resistance. So this patient likely is a pretreatment drug resistant uh, patient and would have benefited maybe from, uh, from baseline genotyping. Okay, so drug resistant genotype returns to the following results. We know it's M184B, uh, and in RTIs, no drug resistance mutations and no uh, drug resistance mutations to PIs. So, aside from continuing TNOs, I don't think what's the best additional drug for this patient? So, do we add the very nevirapine because efavirenz is compromised, or lupinavir ritonavir because efavirenz is compromised, or do we maintain the efavirenz? Okay, sir, hindi ako nakagawa ng poll dito. So, sabihin lang natin siya. Yeah, all right. Just uh, answer it in your mind. And the answer is just maintain the efavirenz because you already have the because you already have the um, the drug resistance uh, the drug resistance assay and you already have drug pressure for that. So, um, uh, most likely hindi na siya hindi siya resistant to efavirenz. Hindi siya resistant to efavirenz. So, nakalusot ka. What I would probably do in this patient in addition is if they can afford it, I would probably check another viral load in three months just to make sure um, na, ano, na, um, na wala talaga. So there's no reason to switch from efavirenz to nevirapine. So there's no evidence of resistance. So you caught it early. So again, you already have a drug resistance um, uh, you already have a drug resistance uh, panel genotype, and so there's no reason to, to do that. Uh, there are situations where I would look at the efavirenz very suspiciously, and that's if the patient is not adherent, because then baka wala lang drug pressure, lalabas yung hindi lumabas yung efavirenz. Pero if you can say with 100% certainty that this patient is absolutely compliant and adherent to his meds, then you can you can safely say that efavirenz uh, probably is still okay. But I would probably do that uh, viral load at three months just to make sure. Kasi minsan nagtatago pa rin yung efavirenz na yan, lalo na with some optimal uh, treatment. In general, kasi ang NNRTI mahina talaga. 
So this is a situation where as long as you are fairly sure the patient is taking the medications and you have adequate drug pressure, you can probably continue with the favorites. But if you have any doubts, then the correct answer is uh, go with the PI. All right. So we already talked about that. So the drugs that can induce resistance to HIV now that they use for treatment of Hep B is uh, lamivudine, clavudine, tenofovir, or entecavir. But it's highly unlikely that the tenofovir will uh, cause M184B. It's usually lamivudine and clavudine. Although it can, but it's more k 65 r so how do we increase uh, adherence? So we really like simpler regimens, one pill a day. Um, and this is why I always tell patients, you know, this is the best possible uh, pill burden that you can have. So please take your medications. I mean, just try to motivate people so that they don't have to take other things. Um, and uh, hopefully the new regimens that are coming will also be one pill a day, the dolutegravir based regimens. Uh, pill boxes can help with multiple meds. You can do recurring reminders, alarms, once a day regimens are still great. Um, we can't really give uh, um, uh, protease inhibitors, lopinavir, ritonavir once a day right now. The reason being most of the time we're using it as uh, treatment uh, salvage or second line treatment. Uh, medication bodies help also uh, reinforcement. Pill counts at each visit, although I know people dump their pills sometimes just to make it look like uh, they're actually taking them. So um, also be wary of that. And then just explain to your patient, buhay mo yan, you know, it's, uh, we're all adults here. And, uh, you know, you really need to try to motivate yourself. Um, so if you're going to send a genotype assay, you can send it to us. Uh, it's a red top 10 cc of blood. Uh, you can submit it up to eight hours after the draw as long as it's kept on ice or refrigerated. Um, it's uh, 4,500 at UP NIH. We'll try to get it back to you in two weeks. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, if you can give us a little bit of ARB history, that'll be best. Um, just so that we can we can better address whether this patient's on treatment or not. We're getting more and more treatment naive samples nowadays. Eh? So in terms of trying to interpret that, iba, uh, if you guys have gotten some of the results we've sent back, merong parang choose your own adventure. If this patient is treatment naive, this is recommended. If this patient is treatment experienced, this is what it is. So it would help us if you could tell us whether the patient is treatment naive or not. Um, uh, because we're seeing uh, drug resistance, uh, transmitted drug resistance already, um, even in treatment naive patients. And that's the phone number uh, over there for SAGIP, actually, um, so we can coordinate the specimen drops. And uh, the, 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 we also have a way to receive it from the provinces right now. I think we're getting samples from Chonghua and even from, from, from Davao. So uh, if some of the provincial hubs want to send to us, you know, we can work that out as well. Um, just to show you a poster we presented about three years ago, uh, you can see that the resistance rates uh, are, are, are climbing, especially to NNRTIs. Also, tenofovir resistance rates are pretty high. Here, I'll show you. So the important conclusions in this study, it's still mostly the new uh, Thailand uh, strain uh, and not much B showing up in the Philippines. Drug treatment failure at one year of antiretrovirals was 10.3%. The scary thing is that 57% of that 10.3% doesn't have a uh, effective second line regimen of three drugs. So kailangan talaga natin ingatan yung meds natin. Part of the problem is we're checking viral loads at the end of one year. So kung nag-fail na yung pasyente at three months, hindi pa natin nadedetect we're giving them a failing regimen for a whole year. So nag accumulate your resistance mutations. We end up uh, losing uh, meds. So if your patients can afford it, um, I, I would actually recommend checking a viral load in three months. Um, I know it's not uh, something that uh, PhilHealth will pay for at this point, but it seems pretty clear to me right now based on the data that we're seeing that there is value in checking a viral load in three months. Um, you don't have to check a baseline viral load or a baseline genotyping if you don't want to. Um, if I had to pick, I would probably take that three-month uh, viral load at, uh, uh, at the start. But if you can do everything, uh, it's great, especially for SAGIP patients right now. Um, there is a program to, to get that done. You know, right now, I would probably recommend baseline, um, baseline uh, drug resistance testing and then a viral load at three months. Uh, and, you know, we're, it's weird because uh, we thought tenofovir was a really, really good drug, but um, 
apparently AZT did better in the one-year study. Um, you can see that the uh, treatment failure rate was 12.6% for AZT, FAB was 3.9%. If you have any patients who are still on tenofovir and nevirapine, please check a viral load. Ang taas ng resistance, uh, ang ng failure rate niya, it was 29%. So it's probably better to get them off that regimen and put them on tenolami if it's at best. I don't want people to start switching like crazy to AZT because of the side effects. So this is with a grain of salt. You know, this is one cross-sectional study, but it does suggest that tenofovir doesn't work as well as we hoped it would. Um, and I would probably still not use AZT for first line just in terms of a side effect issue because um, also it's also harder because it's not single pill. This is just food for thought that there is resistance to tenofovir that's more than expected compared to other genotypes out there. I still think we should use tenolami FAB as first line, but uh, then we should probably monitor closer for resistance until we have other regimens because AZT is just too toxic to be using as first line right now. And just to show you, um, uh, it's not clear here, but itong blue na to, sa K65R, um, that 7% is the resistance in treatment failures among, uh, in, in world literature. Yung sa atin yung orange, it's 39%. So mataas talaga ang tenofovir resistance sa atin. So again, it's something that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, transmitted drug resistance, I can show you some of this data. We presented it about two years ago. We just finished crunching the numbers again. Um, this is what it looks like. So for Sanger-based sequencing, um, um, transmitted drug resistance natin is 10.9%. So NNRTI is at 7.9%. Mataas yan. So you can expect about 7.9% of your patients will fail treatment uh, within about three months. For NGS, ito yung sinabi ko na ubud na mahal. Greater than 5% cutoff, which is kind of the standard. Ang, ang transmitted drug resistance natin is 21.8%. I don't know what that means yet in terms of treatment failures. We're continuing to follow that cohort. But the one above, the Sanger-based sequencing, that's real data. So we're above 10%. So baseline resistance testing is reasonable at that level of uh, transmitted drug resistance. So in summary, uh, resistance to ARVs is emerging. Know the clues to resistance. Uh, check out your viral loads or the genotyping test appropriately, including continuing old regimens before testing. Um, if the patient had previous Hep B treatment, it's a clue to possible pre-existing resistance. Genotyping may be appropriate at baseline. The other thing is when you're switching patients off failing regimens and they have Hep B, don't switch them off the tenofovir. Nakasulat yun lahat sa mga binibigay ko na um, uh, recommendations, uh, drug resistance testing. Because even if they're tenofovir resistant, but they have Hep B, keep the tenofovir on. Otherwise, baka mag flare sila. So that's on top of everything else. And then when you're in doubt, consult the colleagues. We're always here. Kate's here. Um, we're all here. You know, this is a very collegial body. We're we're happy to um, answer questions. And if we have questions as well, we'll we'll bring them to you as well. And you know, we really need more treatment options. So until you take a beer, hopefully we'll get here soon. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Edsel. That was uh, quite a lot for us to um, take in at lunchtime. I know some of you guys might have difficulty in some of the terms, but remember, we are facing some resistance challenges. It is about time. Na kailangan malaman natin about resistance. Your patients who are at risk to start prep, and if so, we do have. Uh, um, second line drugs for those who share 100. Um, and and Kate, um, I'm yep. going to put it out there. If you guys, if you have those patients, um, you can send them to us for, for genotyping. Um, pwede natin pag-usapan yung cost. It's, uh, you know, we can, if we have resources, we can do it for free. Para hindi lang sila matapag. If you have patients who you think might have been started and do zero convert, then we're happy to do the, the genotyping. We'll, we'll figure out resources for that, just so that it doesn't stop anybody from starting prep. Correct. Um, so I, I think this is something which is not related to resistance, but um, someone with an undetectable viral load with a pretty okay CD4 of 285 with fungal skin infection that is persistent and progressive 
by the way, derma session po natin next, next week. week. Yes. Pwede natin itong lahat. <laughs> so, sa mga taga-TDH po, kindly message me. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk more about that. And let's let's try to have that as one of our case uh, our cases for next week. Di ba? Yeah. yeah. Okay, but I, would also, I would also think about, uh, it used to be called penicillium, but now it's thalaromyces. Um, especially this patient went over to Thailand or some other places because some of the fungi, lalo na if it's a weird fungus, it might just be immune reconstitution that it's getting worse. But, you know, we should always be on the lookout for some of the more exotic stuff because, you know, people go all over the place. So, you know, keep it in the back of your mind as well. Mm -hmm. okay. And then, para balik lang ako doon sa kay prep na discussion natin. So the way that we do adherence counseling with our PLHIV who are on ART, it is also very important that we do adherence counseling for those who will start on PrEP then. Diba? Yes. Ayun lang po. Nope. Doc Kate? Okay. So um, uh, we are on time. Wow, Sir Edsel. We hindi lang po kami matapos earlier than scheduled. Oh, yeah. I'd like to thank you for um, taking time out of your busy day to share your knowledge about um, HIV drug resistance to us. We appreciate it greatly. And I hope everybody um, has some new knowledge about this um, issue that we will all definitely face, if not now, but in the near future. Um, if you don't have access to viral load, I do know that there are some institutions without viral load. Um, please let us know so we can coordinate with the nearest um, facility which has it. Maybe it's just a problem of logistics and courier. Um, kung wala tayong viral load, wala po tayong way na malaman na meron tayong drug resistance. So that's the first step that we should do is have access to viral load. Um, for genotyping, Sir Edsel has already given you the contacts of the National Institute of Health. They are one of the two institutions that do provide genotyping aside from RITM. So, yeah. maraming salamat po sa inyong Amen. pakikinig. You are now free to answer your post-test questions. And then, Thank last, you so much. Last na lang, Doc. Plug ko lang niya that you can follow Doc Edsel Salvania on Twitter and on Facebook. <laughs> Ayun. All right. For more information regarding that. Ayun. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great Thank day. You. Bye, Thank sir. you, Doc. Thank you, Doc Angel. Bye, po. God bless. Bye, everyone. Let me just sign my my. Uh...